From Unity of Houston, Texas, this is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational spiritual community providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress now with Rev. Howard Caesar. So, so as not to leave anyone out, I was kind of giving him a break, but I decided I won't. Um, one of the other family members I didn't introduce is my son, Troy. Handsome dude, stand up, Troy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I came across a, a conversation that was taking place be between a director of a mental hospital and a person uh, on the outside. And the question of the person was, uh, how, you, how do you distinguish whether a person really needs treatment and to you know, be in, the, in the, that hospital? And he says, well, we have a test. And the test is that we, we fill up a bathtub full of water, and then we give them a spoon and a teacup and a bucket and see which one they want to use, you know, how they empty the bathtub. And so, um, you know, whether he uses a spoon, or he said, would you, you know, the, the director said, would you use a spoon, a, a teacup, or a bucket? And, and the guy said, well, of course, you'd use a bucket. And uh, the director said, well, no, that's really not the answer. Uh, the answer is uh, to pull the plug. <laughs> How'd you all do? <laughs> well, I don't know if that leads into it or not, but um, spiritual masters and teachers and mystics, including Jesus and Buddha and other avatars through time, have really always emphasized and stressed how important it is in terms of how we see things, how we see our world, how we see all aspects of our world, that we put on the proper lens, that that's a part of our spiritual evolution and unfoldment. We are asked to see with new eyes and hear with new ears. In fact, Jesus spoke of it in exactly that way, uh, that he who has eyes to see and ears to hear um, will receive this message. Others will not. And so it's understanding how it is that we hear that message and see what is to be seen versus being in the dark. And this is what many masters and mystics and teachers try to convey. Jesus, in the book of uh, Mark, the Gospel of, of Mark, uh, said, having eyes ye see not, having ears you hear not, you perceive not. Um, so there are instances where uh, we are always being taken into a place where we can see better spiritually, if you will. We have many levels of consciousness going on in our world. We fluctuate in levels of consciousness within ourselves as well. And it basically is based on our knowledge and our understanding um, and our relationship to life, to God, uh, the principles that we are, have come to understand and live. It would be like a, a person who is at an airport and sees this big jet taking off uh, from the runway. And one person may have no clue how that huge, heavy object is able to actually make it up into the air uh, like that and, and, and make it to a destination. Whereas another person may have an understanding of the principles, the principles behind it of propulsion and of lift because they know that those, under, uh, those principles, there's a whole another level of, of understanding. Well, it's also true spiritually. There are spiritual principles uh, that we can interface with life at a whole another level if we understand them and bring them into play. There are many examples of ways in which we conclude things about life, get impressions flooding in about life, and basically we draw upon them at least initially through the five senses and what they are telling us. Our senses are important to life, you know, they serve us. Um, they make our life more pleasant as we enjoy the various senses, seeing beautiful things, uh, hearing beautiful sounds, um, touching uh, soft and gentle things, tasting food and what have you that's great, you know, smelling wonderful fragrances, whatever it might be. But there is nothing wrong with, you know, taking steps, attempting to surround ourselves with those things that are pleasant of the senses and, um, you know, we all do that, 
we purchase pictures and paintings and hang them on the wall so we can ad admire them. And we, we listen to CDs. And some of our youth you know, constantly have these things in their ears, uh, kind of tuning out the rest of the world sometimes to an extreme. But we can listen to the, the you know, wonderful sounds that uh, please us. We place around ourselves many of us that have a love for flowers and uh, have beauty in that way. In fact, I think most of you know that I have a love for flowers. Uh, I sometimes talk about that. I love tropical flowers, have a lot of those, and some roses and other things like that. And um, they have an amazing uh, fragrance, certain flowers do, uh, like a gardenia, of course. And uh, I also have um, a uh, angel trumpet, several bushes of angel trumpets. And uh, they, you know, they bloom during the day, but it's at night, actually, once evening falls in the darkness that the fragrance comes out like crazy. And on a still night, uh, if that bush is, uh, three bushes I have, is blooming with angel trumpets, it absolutely fills the whole backyard. It is something beautiful and wonderful to, um, you know, to experience. And, um, you know, there, <laughs> there are hibiscus. I, I'm going to tell you about my flowers, OK, if you're all right. It was, <laughs> Like, we're going where I want to go. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, hibiscus are interesting because they only bloom for a day and then the bloom drops, but they're so beautiful and big and huge and exotic and um, they're wonderful. And then there are, the, uh, you know, one time I was going into a nursery, um, and that's dangerous when I go into a nursery because it's like, ooh. Anyway, I saw this one um, rose tree. It was a, a, like a, a trunk that opened up, and it had all these amazing crimson, orange, reddish blooms on it. And I, I went up to it, and, and it had a fragrance. Not all roses have a fragrance. And this was amazing fragrance. And so then I, I looked at the price. And uh, there was a tag there. And on the price, it also had what it was called. Many roses are given a name. And you know what it was called? Outrageous. <laughs> Outrageous! What a perfect name for that, you know. And so I bought it. I <laughs> took it home. <laughs> Became my friend. Uh, said hello, outrageous, every morning, you know, and smelled the blooms and uh, make them their friends, you know. But uh, you know, moving on to the next sense, which is uh, taste. You know, ask yourself what what is it that comes to mind in terms of taste that is like your favorite thing that you go to first. What is it? What snaps in there? Ah, I know what it is, you know? For me, you interested in what mine is? Uh, it's sweet corn. Yeah, sweet corn. I like to bathe it in butter, sprinkle the salt on it, and then it's, it's wonderful. Matter of fact, when I go back home to Wisconsin, um, everywhere I go, all the relatives have the stack of corn on the cob uh, that I eat everywhere. It's really kind of corny, uh, that, uh, that kind of thing. Diane loves to make corn for me, too, in a treat um, as well. Um, but that's one of the things I love. And then, of course, we all have a weakness uh, to the sense of being drawn. And maybe we don't all, but many of us uh, are drawn to the, the chocolate, the chocolate, you know. And uh, I know I am, and I have to work on that to kind of lay off of it. Um, staff and volunteers often bring into my office, if I'm gone, I come back and on my chair or on my desk, there's a piece of cake or there's a chocolate bar or something. And so I don't know what they're trying to do to me. Uh, but anyway, we was mentioning our grandchildren are here visiting us. And uh, of course, they love uh, chocolate. They do. They, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So anyway, in fact, you know, um, the five-year-old Dylan, uh, when we say chocolate, uh, she doesn't say chocolate. She says, chocolate. <laughs> it's very sacred. It's her eyes roll back, and it's like uh, amazing. And of course, we use that to bribe them, uh, to make sure to eat, eat their vegetables and, and be good and all of that. But anyway, I, allow me to go back to flowers, you know, because flowers are my favorite. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to make a point, and the point is, um, you know, the beauty and the fragrance of a flower is great externally, but then the, the neat thing is that eventually uh, it takes us further. We get in touch with inner senses. 
that at some point um, our spiritual senses are engaged beyond our external five outer senses. And it takes us to a place deeper within where we engage with that which is the life behind it all. You get what I'm saying? You see the flower and its beauty, you, feel, you, you smell the fragrance, and it takes you to the realization that this is one of God's creation that you've been blessed with and you're surrounded with. And it takes you to a deeper place if you will allow it. You're drawn into a sense of being with the one life, the one intelligence that connects us to something. It's something wonderful. And when we start out in life, <clears throat> we depend upon particularly our outer senses. That's where we begin. And the information that it provides as we look out at the world as a three-dimensional kind of experience. And eventually we mature and we progress and evolve to where we begin to balance that with awakening our inner senses. And that part of the spiritual path is not just to experience the world three-dimensionally alone on the surface of the external, what our external senses tell us, but really we have to get to another level of senses that exist within us, where we experience and go beyond the seen into the unseen, if you will. We graduate there, and it's in the unseen, really, that we begin to know what faith is about. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's very significant. It's also where intuition is born, where we get signs and signals and subtle messages that are beyond the messages that we receive from a, in, a, in an external three-dimensional way. We say that we're a metaphysical church, and it's always important to understand that that means meta means beyond. Beyond what? The physical, beyond the literal. We're going beyond, and, and part of our life and part of our spiritual evolution and unfoldment is to mature beyond just what we see. And it's all good and great, the external and the five senses that way. But it's a basically to, to go beyond that as well. When we start out as a child, you know, we, we, our, our concept of God is typically that, that God is like a man standing out in, in, in the heavens somewhere looking down on us. And that's okay, that's fine, but we are loyal to that for a period of time until we kind of mature to God being more than that. And we begin to incorporate the idea that God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so now God is not separate and distant, but now God is a spirit, you know, that is everywhere present and actually dwells within me. And that's a powerful thing to come to, you see, that is taking you beyond simply the external three-dimensional surfacy way in which we sometimes start out in using our senses. We grow beyond that. And so we begin and come to a place where, um, you know, we sometimes say, will you come to your senses? Well, I think of this as coming to our spiritual senses. And that's the path we're all on to some extent, is because if we are to live in this world and experience some degree of peace, it's to really be able to see a reality, know a reality beyond what may be out there. Uh, as good as it can be, uh, there are factors that are difficult to put in place. Um, so there's another level of knowing. And when asked the question, okay, uh, how many senses do you have? Most people would say, well, five, right? Well, I'd like to submit that no, we have actually 10. We have the 10 that we use in a very three-dimensional external way, and we have five, not 10, I almost, we have five that we use in the three-dimensional external way, and we have five that are spiritualized, that we're meant to spiritualize. That is a dimension of the unseen in all of those senses that we have. It's that goes beyond. And so the typical person grows up receiving this information and uh, in an external way. And at some point, they realize there's more. But while they're caught up in that, for however long, we become hypnotized by the outer world. We become hypnotized by what is happening out there and the impressions that we have and all of the voices that we hear that says this is what life is about. We're fed judgments. We're fed uh, messages on what to like and what not to like, what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of, what's okay and what's not okay, what su constitutes success in life and what doesn't, uh, what is beauty and what isn't, what's good and what's bad. All of this is fed to us. And sometimes, sometimes, you know, we've developed biases and prejudices about food as well as people uh, that get in the way and, uh, and create 
inner conflicts and what have you. So how we view, how we view our neighbor, how we view a stranger, how we view another person, um, has something to do with whether or not we have really come to our spiritual senses. It really does. Charles Fillmore was co-founder of Unity, and he, along with other great teachers and writers, uh, really had a distinction about consciousness. There are many ways to talk about consciousness, but he broke it down into two, and many spoke of it just exactly that way. And he said there is sense consciousness, that which looks out at the three-dimensional world of things, and then there is spiritual consciousness. And that essentially our path and our growth as a spiritual being is to move actually from sense consciousness into spiritual consciousness. And when one does that, then everything one lays his eyes upon and what one hears is all monitored by another higher vibration of inner knowing that just allows a, a, a sense of peace to be restored and maintained, a sense of faith in, in the possibilities of good that are, underlie everything. Um, it's a very, a very important part of, of our life and living. There's a guy, uh, Gary Zukov. Some of you know, he's a wonderful author. He's been here to speak. And he wrote a book uh, called Seat of the Soul. And he made a distinction between personality, one's personality and one's soul. And he was saying that personality really is, uh, the personality of a person is that which looks out at the world through the five senses. And that the person that lives from this deeper part of themselves is really that person that comes from their soul. And th those who do, he says, are multi-sensory. That was the word he gave it, multi-sensory. That's what we're meant to, to get to, is to take the five senses to a new and higher and deeper kind of uh, relationship with, uh, uh, within ourselves, a spiritualizing of them, if you will. Let me read from his book, because he's very clear uh, about a, one passage in particular that I was drawn to. He said this, every person has a soul, but a personality that is limited in its perception to the five senses is not aware of its soul, and therefore cannot recognize the influences of its soul. As a personality becomes multisensory, its intuitions, its hunches, and subtle feelings become important to it. It senses things about itself, other people, and the situations in which it finds itself that it cannot justify on the basis of the information that its five senses can provide. It comes to recognize intentions and to respond to them rather than to the actions and the words that it encounters, rather the, outs, the outer. He says it can recognize, for example, a warm heart beneath a harsh and angry manner and a cold heart beneath polished and pleasing words. So the question is, how does one achieve you know, uh, this sense of peace when there's so much pressing down on us in the world and there's many things going on out there that our outer senses incorporate and pull in and record in a way that may not be favorable, you know. And it drains us of a sense of patience, a sense of oneness with one another, poise, peace of mind, what have you. And uh, how do we remain, we remain fearless? and fulfilled in this life when there is so much around us happening that is hard to digest and can cause us fear and doubt. So the answer to that is we have to begin to consciously attain a perception of a higher order. You know, and we have to be able to begin to see beyond what we have been conditioned to see. That we have to see beyond what is to what can be and where things are wanting to go. And what is the reality in the realm of unseen that is the truth beyond what may be going on and happening. And what is it that you wish to identify with? And what is it that you want to give the power to? You know, what can be and what is seeking to be birthed and come forth in the expression of manifestation and livability? Or what currently is? And what is? Everything is changing on the plane of life. There is no permanency. Everything is trying to move forward and onward into something better, even when we can't understand it. And so we have to begin to hear beyond what we've been conditioned to hear and see beyond what we've been conditioned to see and then develop these deeper senses of what is possible. Gary Zukov, in his writing, says this. He says, the higher order 
of logic and understanding of the multi-sensory personality reveals connections where no connections are apparent to the five sensory personality and finds meaning where no meaning is apparent to the five sensory personality. A five sensory personality, he says, is not able to process fully the data of its senses. Its perception of reality is segmented. Its experience of the universe is partitioned. We separate on out. So the higher order of logic and understanding that Gary Zukav speaks about is another way that Jesus is referring again to what Jesus said. He who has eyes to see and he who has ears to hear is going to experience a whole other level of truth and reality and begin to live from that. And so he's referring to this another level of sensitivity. Uh, there's a parable that I love, which is actually the parable of the ten virgins, okay? And it's found in Matthew, the Gospel of. And I would, I'd like to read it and share it with you. You may be familiar with it, but I'd like for you to think of it in terms of it talking about our five senses. But it talks about ten virgins. Yeah, but it separates out the ten virgins. As to some are wise and some are foolish. Five and five. What else could it be talking about except the five senses? And so the story goes, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish, they took their lamps, but they took no oil with them. But the wise, they took oil in their vessels, in their lamps. And while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and they all slept. And then at midnight, a cry came out. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. And so then all the virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. But the foolish said to the wise, Oh, give us some of your oil, because ours has gone out. But the wise said, Uh-uh, uh-uh, we may not then have oil for us or for all. We have to really keep ours. You go to those who sell and get oil. While they went to sell, the bridegroom came, and those that were ready and prepared went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came also all the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say to you, I know you not. I know you not. Now, this could be taken as, oh, God shuts the doors on us. No, we shut the door on ourselves by not having the oil of truth and the unseen and the connection that allows the lamp that we are meant to be be a light in the world. You are meant to be in the light in the world. Jesus called all of us to be that, you see. But we have to bring the truth to the lamp that we are. And the way that we can bring the oil of truth is to not necessarily always be loyal to what's happening out there as being the worst ever that there is something else unfolding on another level that's trying to bring us forward together into oneness, into love, into uh, another reality that is the truth of God. And it's simply knowing that, and because really the, the bridegroom simply represents, you know, getting into the room where the party was going on, and the party is the reality of the way life is to be lived if you come from that truth that really sets you free. And so the foolish, you know, they have no oil, and so they have no light, and therefore they gather all the impressions of limitation and lack in the world. That's what they focus on, is where their senses go. They haven't been spiritualized, so they see what is instead of what can be. They see what is instead of what the truth really is that exists and that they can bring forth in partnership with the bridegroom. And so they gain impressions of limitation, of judgments, of separation, negativity, things of fear and failure, disease, old age, what is wrong in the world, what's wrong with themselves, what's wrong with everything. It's all external, driven. And there's a little hope in that. There's darkness. Our lamp isn't lit. It's lacking the oil, you see. And there's little that one can report on in that way. The wise virgins, they had oil, they had light, they were able to get inside the party, they were to get beyond the door. 
In fact, there's a parallel here with the 23rd Psalm, very powerful Psalm, you know, where it says, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Who are your enemies except circumstances and situations you face that put your light out, okay? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. That's the way we're supposed to live. Because then surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house. I get to go to the party forever. The true reality. Spiritual maturity hinges on the development of those inner senses and perception. The physical senses, yeah, they report the facts. Facts change. They're meant to change and move beyond into a field of possibility where really the divine is always leading us. And will we light the lamp that helps lead the way? Many have overcome or been overwhelmed by the facts. And, the, you know, Moses standing at the Red Sea and all the Israelites were murmuring against him in fear. This is a dead end. Look where you have led us. We have no hope. And what did he say? Ah, come with me and see. See beyond what is. See beyond what your, your outer senses of the three dimension is simply reporting. He said, fear not, stand firm, and see with me the salvation of the Lord that he will work for us today. He took them into a whole other vibration, and things part. A way is found, and that's the way it's done. Prayer will help you get there, of course. A willingness to really not be always judging by appearances, uh, but being willing to determine to be determined to see things differently, to listen to the voice of intuition, to the subtle something inside you that is of the soul, that is beyond the personalities of the external that we have been built upon. It's to decide to bring light into the world, to bring love into the world. It's to stand firm and see a truth beyond the facts. It's to bring the oil of truth into the light of day and the light of the world that you are all meant to be. We're here to make a difference. We really are. And we're here to remember that let nothing separate us from one another in any way. And let us always come together, hold hands, join hearts, and realize that we're all part of God. Oneness is what it's about. Go be a light in the world. God bless you all. When you visit Unity of Houston, you'll find a spiritual community, a church where you can connect and learn and grow with a progressive approach to Christianity. At Unity, we welcome you no matter what your beliefs. You'll find a teaching, loving, inspiring experience as we help each other be all we're created to be. Check us out. We'd love to have you. Find us online at unityhouston.org. And remember, life is meant to be good. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. Unity is inclusive, welcoming people of all walks of life in dignity and love. We believe that love, strength, and goodness dwells within you. May we all live in unity with God, humanity, and all of God's creation. And remember, as Reverend Caesar says, life is meant to be good.